Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our second and final video in our ecology series. This is ecology part two. This is also our final AP Bio lecture video of the year. You guys have been through quite quite the marathon with me this year, um, and I appreciate all of your all of your efforts and all of your attention. So let's wrap this up, right? So here I have our last picture. This is Jack. He's about four or five in this picture with a butterfly. Uh, it's obviously an awesome picture and shows some ecology, which is why I picked it for our last lecture presentation. Okay, so this first slide just gives a definition of ecosystem. We defined this back in the first video, all the organisms living in a community, as well as the abiotic factors in which they interact. Ecosystems can be um, as small as a, a fallen log in the woods to as large as a lake or ocean or a forest. So one of the big important topics in this um, last video <coughs> is the flow of energy and, and chemicals or, or mass matter really fueling ecosystem. So we're gonna study ecosystems two ways. We're gonna study how energy flows through them, obviously beginning with energy from the sun. And we're gonna see how chemicals flow through them with chemicals you know, don't think of it chemicals like, you know, acids and bases. Think chemicals like just the matter, the carbons and nitrogens and oxygens and hydrogens that go through the ecosystem. Um, sort of like the, the circle of life. What flows through an ecosystem are chemicals, as in matter, and then energy, all right? And we need to, to address both of those things. So this slide, there's a lot on here, and you know, this stuff that you, that you don't really need to necessarily have memorized. Um, but the conservation of energy, so all energy enters our ecosystem through the sun. The sun's the, the primary, the ultimate source of energy, right? The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed in a system. It's only transferred or, or transformed. So basically the first way that we transform energy in an ecosystem is through photosynthesis, right? Plants or algae take the sun's energy and they convert it into chemical energy, right? Without that, there's no, there's no life on earth, right? Um, any transfer of energy is gonna be somewhat wasteful, you're going to lose some energy, things aren't 100% efficient. And this point here, how energy is dissipated is heat. Heat is, remember heat we said back in chapter like four or five or six, heat was like the most base form of energy. It's sort of like, it's, you know, it's not necessarily a, a waste, but it's energy that's not used to do something else. It's just given off. It's dissipated as heat. Um, the second law of thermodynamics states that the energy or that every energy exchange increases the entropy of the universe. Entropy is a, a measure of disorder. We don't, we don't really need um, to get into entropy in, in AP bio. Um, the, it's the first law of thermodynamics that really we need to be concerned about is transferring energy from one level to another and how you lose some energy is heat, all right? Now, so we had that, great. The analogous law for mass is the conservation of mass, right? And this law says that matter cannot be created nor destroyed. It's just recycled, right? Um, the chemical elements, particularly carbon, nitrogen, um, and oxygen are, are elements, or things like phosphorus, they get cycled through ecosystems, um, largely as things either get eaten by other things or as things decay, all right? And we're going to go through like, like the carbon cycle, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, how matter gets, gets transferred through ecosystems, all right? So again, we're looking at energy and we're looking at matter, all right? Energy and matter, energy and matter, okay? Okay, so energy, mass, and trophic levels. So this, this is not particularly complicated stuff here. So you know, you know, things that use the sun's energy through photosynthesis to make chemical energy, those are, those are autotrophs, right? Heterotrophs are things that eat autotrophs or other heterotrophs, right? Trophic structure, food chains, food web. So basically we're, we're looking at different ways of tracking energy and matter through an ecosystem. <clears throat> um, largely in, you know, in, in what's eating what, you know, if a, if a grasshopper eats a plant, what's happening is the matter of the plant is turning into grasshopper, right? 
So the trophic levels, these terms are probably not new to you. You definitely need to know these terms. Primary producers, the one with a little degree sign means primary. Primary producers are organisms that perform photosynthesis, so plants or algae. Without them, there's, you know, there's nothing else, right? Primary consumers are things that eat producers. So these are your herbivores, things like a grasshopper. Secondary consumers are carnivores that eat herbivores. And you know, when I give examples here, a lot of times there's more than one example, or you could have an, an organism that could fall in more than one category, like humans. Humans obviously are carnivores. They eat other carnivores, but they also eat plants. So they can be you know, both. Um, a primary consumer, again, like a grasshopper, is something that eats plants. A secondary consumer, <coughs> excuse me, would be a carnivore that eats herbivores, things like a mouse, right? A tertiary consumer is a carnivore that eats other carnivores, like humans, potentially snakes, a hawk. Um, the tritivores or decomposers are things like a bacteria or a fungus that feed off decaying organic matter. The word detritus, this word detritus here is a word that you should know. Detritus is just things that were living that are, that are decaying. So a decaying log, a decaying mouse, you know, organic matter that's dead and, and decaying, all right? Decomposers feed off all the levels. Anything can become food for a decomposer. Uh, here we just show some mushrooms. These are decomposers growing upon the remnants of a hollowed out log. Okay, so this is a pretty simple diagram. Um, this shows just gives examples of um, things at each stage. So my first example, this would be like a terrestrial system, like on land. A flower gets eaten by a grasshopper, gets eaten by some kind of rodent, gets eaten by a snake, gets eaten by a bird. This would be a marine example. You have like little phytoplankton get eaten by some kind of protozoa or some kind of, of larva of some animal, get eaten by fish, get eaten by large fish, get eaten by things like whales. Um, one thing I want to point out about a diagram like this, so this is an easy diagram, right? No one misunderstands this, right? A grasshopper is eating the flower and look how the arrows are pointing up. But a problem that a lot of kids end up having is if they give you a diagram like this, but they don't give you pictures of animals, they just give you letters, like if that's just A, B, C, D, and E. Um, you know, the flower is becoming the grasshopper because the grasshopper is eating the flower. If this wasn't pictures, it was just letters. If this was A turning into B, I oftentimes have students who will think that A is eating B, right? that's the flower eating the grasshopper, which you wouldn't do that if you saw the pictures, right? But the arrows are indicating where matter is going. So the matter of the flower is going into the grasshopper because the grasshopper eats the flower. All right, we'll do an example of this where you don't have pictures in just a minute. Um, this is showing sort of like a, a, a web of all this. The blue is chemicals, the sort of orange color is energy. The sun obviously is the first source of energy, goes to producers which can go to consumers, can go to uh, secondary, tertiary consumers. <coughs> the trias, again, is just what you call them when they're dead. And decomposers are things that feed off things that are dead. Notice that every single level, you have energy being given off largely as waste, which would be heat. Um, yeah, pretty much every level, OK? So this is a sample problem. Um, I think on your outline, I, th I think you have this picture. So take a minute and just write down each of the, the six letters. So if, if an exam gave you a picture like this, I wanted you to identify what trophic level each letter is at, like primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. Um, so let's just do one. So the, the, these are simple problems, right? But they can, you know, kids can overthink things um, and get these wrong. So. The first thing that I try to do with these is to identify what the base of the food chain is. All right, what's the primary producer? The base of the diagram isn't necessarily the base of the food chain. They could have a diagram on its side, right? But in this case, A, this is the primary producer, right? A is the one with the little degree sign. So this is a plant or an algae. That's definitely the primary producer because it's, it's going into, you know, to, to say F and to B. The next thing that I tend to do is I try to identify what the decomposer level is. 
And the decomposer is basically what everything goes to, right? Everything goes to F. A goes to F, B goes to F, D goes to F, E goes to F. I guess C isn't going to F, but you know, it totally could, just there's no arrow. So F is your decomposer, all right? Everything ends up being decomposed. So A is a primary producer. B would be a primary consumer. So B is the, um, the one with the little degree sign consumer. So primary producer here, primary consumer here. Um, C would be a secondary consumer. Um, D would be as a secondary conducer. Conducer, well, consumer. E would be a uh, tertiary consumer, right? So A is primary producer, B is primary consumer, C and D are secondary consumers, E is tertiary consumer, and F is a decomposer, okay? All right. Okay, so new topic. So trophic efficiency and ecological pyramids. So this is an important concept. So do you see in the picture, um, the J stands for joules, J is a unit of, of energy. So here we're looking at energy, not matter. Um, this is showing, or is a depiction of what's called a 10% rule. So here I have 10,000 joules of flour, 10,000 joules of primary producer. On average, when you go from one level to the next, only 10% gets transferred, right? So it took a million joules of sunlight to get 10,000 joules worth of flour, which gave me 1,000 joules of grasshopper, 100 joules of mouse, and 10 joules worth of, of uh, apex bird, right? Apex predator, a hawk, or whatever, okay? It's called the 10% rule. So what happened to the other 90%? Well, you can read this. So some of it gets lost as heat, right? We've said that. Um, some of it is just used by the animal where it says lost through respiration, lost, you know, might not be the best word there. So, you know, when the flower is using the light, it uses some of that energy to become more flower or to keep the flower alive, right? So it's not really lost, it's just used in that level, right? Um, some of it could be lost in what's, and you have waste, you have feces, waste matter that doesn't, you know, turn into flour. It's just wasted because it's waste um, or unconsumed portions of the, of the food source. So like when grasshoppers eat flowers, only 10% of the flower actually goes to the grasshopper in terms of energy, right? 90% is kept in the flower or the flower used it or or maybe the grasshopper pooped out parts of the flower, maybe some of the fibrous parts that the grasshopper couldn't use. So only 10% of the energy in one level is available to the next level, okay? The 10%, well, of course, that the 10% is an average. It could be more, it could be less, but 10% is like a global average. Biomodification, this is a very important concept. Um, this is actually very, very relevant. Um, and ecology. So look at this trophic structure. So, you know, this is this is not surprising. You're seeing each level, the, the water producers, zooplankton, small fish, large fish, things like a hawk. Um, the level beneath it has to be larger to support the level above it, right? Because you, you lose matter and energy at each level. So biomodification is the concept. You know, you might lose 90% of the energy or the mass from one level to, to another but you don't lose toxins, right? Toxins get concentrated as you go up the chain because the toxins are not decaying. The best example is the example of DDT, which is a pesticide. DDT is a pesticide that was sprayed to kill mosquitoes to help control the spread of malaria. If we haven't discussed this already in class, I'm sure that we will. Um, you wanna control malaria, you control your mosquito population. DDT kills mosquitoes, so you just spray you know, mosquitoes lay their eggs in water that's not moving. So like an, a stagnant lake or even like after a rainstorm, there's a puddle of water that isn't moving or even like a, a flower pot sitting in your yard where the water builds up from rain and just sits there. Mosquitoes lay their eggs and they hatch. So you spray water sources like lakes with DDT, kills the mosquitoes, you stop the spread of malaria, especially in tropical areas, right? Um, the problem is, you know, if you look at the concentration of DDT, you know, it's not very high here. Here's just a one. 
But as you go up, you're losing mass, mass that's lost, but the DDT is still there and it's becoming more and more concentrated. What was happening was the top of your food chains, particularly birds that eat fish, um, this is showing an eagle, the birds were dying because we're spraying DDT, we don't think it's a big deal, but it concentrates up the food chain. Again, the concept is called biomagnification. Um, you know, the producers are fine, the zooplankton's fine, the fish are fine, but the eagles are dying, all right? Um, this was a very, very, very big deal in the mid 20th century. Um, and, you know, th this is a faint, fascinating story. Rachel Carson was a scientist in the 60s who wrote a book called Silent Spring. And um, there's a video here where I, I'll, I'll probably show this video. It's like 10 minutes. I'll probably show it in class just because um, I don't want to show it during the video. Um, she was vilified by members of the scientific community who basically said that she was wrong. She was a hack. She didn't know what she was talking about. Her book becomes a bit of a public sensation because it's very well written and it, it lays out the case for biomagnification in DDT. And, and again, she was she was treated very, very poorly. Um, and part of it follows this theme of women in science, you know, earlier times where they weren't taken seriously. Anyway, end of the story, she's vindicated. She's absolutely right. DDT becomes banned in the US in 1971. And um, this issue, at least with DDT, um, largely goes away due, due to her efforts. Um, the, the book Silent Spring, it's a great question. It's always on Jeopardy. They ask about Silent Spring on Jeopardy and Rachel Carson. It's one of those books that if you lived during the time, you would know it, you'd know who she was. Nowadays, most people don't, don't know who Rachel Carson was. Um, but it's just, it's, it's a good name to know in the history of science and environmental advocacy. Okay, so now let, let's switch gears, okay? So biological and geochemical cycles, um, you know, we've discussed this. It's the circle of life. All right, if you don't have a way of cycling carbon through the ecosystem, eventually you run out of carbon because all the carbon builds up in one trophic level. There's no carbon for the other trophic levels. Um, decomposers play a crucial role because when decomposers break things down, you know, they turn you back into your, back into dirt or whatever that other um, organisms can use to build more of themselves, right? So what we're gonna do, this is a flashback to middle school, right? Um, we're just going to briefly go through a diagram of each of these um, biochemical cycles. Again, this is easy, um, but it's worth just going through briefly. So the water cycle, you, you've done this before, although some of this might be, some of these words might be new. So, <coughs> um, oh, where should we start? So you have evaporation from the ocean, it turns water into water vapor, you form clouds. This term evapotranspiration so on the land, you can have evaporation from lakes, right? Transpiration, remember back in back from a way earlier chapter was when water gets evaporated from the from open stomata and leaves. Evapotranspiration is on land because it combines evaporation from lakes and also transpiration from, from plants. So both those produce clouds, then you get precipitation through clouds, um, through rain. Um, water percolates in the soil. You get runoff right from the, from groundwater back into the ocean. It's the water cycle, all right? So the carbon cycle, this is getting a little more detailed. The carbon cycle is how we transfer carbon, right, through the ecosystem. Obviously, this is, you know, we're, a, we're way far removed from chapters seven and eight, respiration and photosynthesis, but this is, this is chapter seven and eight. So let's begin with CO2 in the atmosphere. How do I go from CO2 in the atmosphere to organic compounds, that's photosynthesis, that's plants and algae. How do I go from biochemicals, plants and algae, back to CO2? Well, that's respiration. Remember, photosynthesis is just plants and algae. Respiration is everything besides, well, bacteria don't do cellular respiration. They do, obviously, fermentation or, or glycolysis. Um, anyway, that turns the organic molecules back into CO2. Um, phytoplankton, again, phytoplankton can do both. When things die and decompose, um, that can put carbon back in the soil, back into the ocean. You can dissolve carbon in, in seawater. Um, and obviously the burning of fossil fuels, which we'll get to in a minute, also that, that's not really in, or what is organic because fossil fuels are, are organic, but that's something mankind is doing. But that also puts CO2 in the atmosphere, all right? So the link between CO2 and biomolecules is photosynthesis. 
really between biomolecules and or, or organic molecules and CO2 would be respiration and uh, decomposition. So the nitrogen cycle, this one we've probably briefly mentioned. So nitrogen gas is in two, and most of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas. It's a very inert gas. Um, we're not going to go through all the details here. The, the highlight we need to hit, though, we've said this before, is you know N2 gas is two ends with a triple bond, and you don't have enzymes to bring that triple bond. So nitrogen-fixing bacteria are the only organisms on Earth that can turn into gas and do things like ammonium or nitrates or nitrites. Um, we discuss how these nitrogen-fixing bacteria can live in, the, in these nodules and plant roots. The different levels of ammonification, nitrification, we're not, we're not gonna worry about that. But you just need to know that to get into, into a, a, a form that's usable, you need nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And of course, denitrification would be turning nitrates or whatever back into N2 gas, all right? As long as you know that nitrogen fixation happens by bacteria that turn into into ammonia or ammonium, um, then you're fine. All right, switching gears again. Here we're just hitting some highlights. So greenhouse gases and climate change. So this is a topic we need to talk about. We haven't really discussed this much all year because this is obviously relevant to ecology and to you know to to modern life. So human activity is burning fossil fuels puts CO2 gas into the atmosphere, which is, you know, that, that's a greenhouse gas. Um, the AP exam loves to have you interpret graphs. So let's interpret this graph. So here I have the yeah, x-axis is time. Um, I need my little bar to go away. But from the mid 20th century through 2010, in this case, the left-hand axis is the CO2 concentration in parts per million, um, going from the low 300s up to close to 400. That, that's a big increase in a short period of time. Average global temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, the blue line is showing the CO2 concentrations and the red line is showing the temperature. And clearly there is a correlation. Now where this graph comes from is very important, which we'll discuss in just a second. But there's a clear correlation between increasing CO2 levels and increasing global temperature. Um, Deforestation is also an issue because deforestation, you know, plants absorb CO2, right? They take in CO2. So if we have fewer plants, that's increasing the CO2 levels because, you know, they're called CO2 sinks because they take in the CO2. There's fewer CO2 sinks, then you have more of it in, in the atmosphere. Now, one thing I want to talk about, so I don't think I do it, I think I do it on a, a later slide, yeah, is why this, why the levels of CO2 go up and down? See how it's like a uh, scratchy line? Well, when is CO2 production or how does CO2 production change throughout the year? Well, in the summer months, you have way more plant activity. So there's way more photosynthesis, which lowers CO2. In the winter months, you have more respiration or really it's less photosynthesis. So CO2 levels are going um, to change because plants aren't taking in CO2 as much. So the blue line going up and down is just showing seasonal changes in CO2, but overall you can see the trend is for the blue line to go up. So that blue line comes from um, a place called the Mauna Loa, Observ Mauna Loa Observatory, which is in Hawaii. Um, this is a, a government facility run by NOAA um, that's on the top of a mountain. You can see it here um, in Hawaii and the Mauna Loa Observatory has been tracking CO2 levels for decades. And the reason why this one is important is because one, it's, it's sort of at or above the cloud tops and it's not, it's not near, like if you had this observatory near a factory that gave off CO2, you'd have like interference, right? This isn't near any local source of CO2. It's high enough to where you don't get variations um, you know, from, from, what, from what's next door, right? Um, this graph, this is a similar graph. Um, this shows the annual cycle of CO2. This just shows CO2 versus time. How you can see that the, the CO2 levels are going up um, and then they come down in the summer months because in the summer months, obviously plants take in CO2 because they're doing photosynthesis. So that the, the, the up and down of, of annual variations, just again, the season, overall, you can tell the trends going up. And, you know, going from close to 300 parts per million, 
the upwards of 400 and the span of, you know, 50 years, that's an incredible amount of change in a very, very short period of time, you know, geologically speaking. So this is a short video. It's like four minutes on the Mauna Loa Observatory. I think it's worth actually briefly watching. Well, this is Mauna Loa Observatory run by NOAA. And we're on Mauna Loa, which is the most massive mountain in the world. In fact, if you measure it from the ocean floor to the summit, it's taller than Everest is. What we do here and in our other sites around the world is collect this time series of greenhouse gases and solar radiation and other aspects of the atmosphere. A really unique thing about Mauna Loa is that it's so far from any of the continents and that's really good for the air sampling because we're not seeing point sources from cities. Another important factor is it's so tall that on most days we're above the boundary layer. The boundary layer is where you have most of the pollution and water vapor and particulates. So we're not seeing the influences of, say, the island. Well, our climate monitoring division of NOAA has two really big jobs. One is greenhouse gases, but the other is tracking the ozone issue. We have a Dobson instrument three times a day we'll have one of our staff open up a little dome and point the Dobson at the sun. The sun is like a big light bulb, and we can measure two different wavelengths of ultraviolet light. One is absorbed by the ozone, and one's not. And just by comparing the two, you can tell how much ozone's between you and the sun. And we'll be tracking it until the ozone layer recovers. Well, I will be running a LIDAR. The word comes from laser radar. And it's a laser that I'll be shooting vertically up into the atmosphere. And the main measurement I get from it is the amount of particles that are in the atmosphere. And the main reason we do that is periodically there's a really big volcano that'll go off somewhere in the world. This is a chance to check our understanding of how the atmosphere works. Well, another thing we measure at Mauna Loa Observatory is solar radiation. And we measure that in many different ways. The whole Earth climate system is driven by the sun. So we've got the incoming radiation from the sun. And as it, some of it propagates through the atmosphere, some of it is absorbed, some of it's scattered back. And then the, the radiation that meets the Earth's surface is absorbed, and then that's re-emitted, except now it's in the infrared range of the spectrum. We've got all these, these arrows of energy going every which way, and if you really want to understand how it all works, you have to measure each one of these components. Some are easy, some are very hard, but that's the whole energy balance of the Earth that creates our weather, creates our climate. So this is a excellent place to calibrate these solar instruments. So we have many groups from United Nations and Department of Energy and NASA, all sorts of places that will bring the instruments up here and run them for a week or two, however long they need to calibrate them. And then they will take them to different locations and um, make their measurements. We continue to develop new techniques and this is a great laboratory for building new instruments and testing them. Going back to, say, the ozone problem, when they saw the ozone hole form in the Antarctic, that was completely unexpected. And there was a huge debate on what could be doing this. But there's bound to be other little, other big phenomena out there like that that we just haven't fathomed yet. Okay, so... I thought that was worth br briefly showing. So, um, turn that off. So, of course, the idea with greenhouse gases, things like CO2, things like methane or greenhouse gases, which act like a greenhouse, that they, um, you know, the sun's radiation hits the atmosphere, some of it goes through the atmosphere, hits the Earth's surface, a lot of it gets reflected back um, into the atmosphere or into space. 
the greenhouse effect is the idea that certain gases like CO2 act kind of like a blanket and they trap the sun's radiation at Earth's surface, which obviously would lead to, to a warming planet, all right? You know, there's, you know, endless amounts of debate about things like this, but there, there's no denying that increasing the concentration of CO2 will increase the planet. And there's no denying a graph like this, like the CO2 levels have gone up. Um, and it, I mean, it's because we've been burning fossil fuels for, you know, since really the industrial revolution. Um, something else you can do, and th this is just worth briefly mentioning. So, you know, scientists can predict the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere millennia ago um, during, during ice ages. How, how do they do that? Well, this is just kind of cool. So ice cores, you can look at, at uh, this lady hold, holding an ice core. Um, you drill cores from glaciers and basically, you know, you have air bubbles that are trapped in glaciers. When water freezes, you can have air bubbles trapped in it. And so if you have ways of, of dating um, how old the air bubble was, which, you know, the depth of the core obviously tells you something. Um, you can also do a radiometric analysis. You can tell what the levels of CO2 are in that little air bubble um, going back, you know, hundreds, thousands of years by using ice core samples. It's really interesting. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up here. So, you know, the, the book ends with the question of how's the human population growing? You can read what's on this slide. This graph is, is more illustrative than that. So if you look at, at the human population, um, you're 7 billion uh, just after 2000, I guess. So, you know, around, 1800 or so, we really kick into high gear with exponential growth. Um, the exponential part slows down some. Like this, at this point, when it starts, the slope goes down, it's no longer exponential. It's almost like it's trying to approach a logistic growth model. Um, the question would be what's the global carrying capacity for humans? How many humans can the biosphere support? Well, then this is just stuff from your textbook. Um, 10, 15 billion is the average estimate. Obviously, the carrying capacity of Earth is hard to pin down. Um, how many people can the Earth hold? Well, I mean, our ability to produce food, to handle waste, non-renewable resources, um, those all affect carrying capacity. And you know, as our technology increases or improves, carrying capacity could could change. Um, but you know, reading a graph like this is something that the AP exam might have you do. Um, you know, we were exponential, now we're, we're not. Um, the book ends with a note on the future of the, of the biosphere. You know, it's hard to find a great way to end all of our lectures for AP Bio. Um, just, a, just a reflection on the, the huge diversity and different kinds of life on, on the planet. This is the very last slide. This is an image from your book. This just shows um, some biology through the ages. Here we have a cave painting in France from 17,000 years ago a 30,000 year old um, carving of a water bird in Germany. And here we have some more, more modern interactions with people um, and biology. But you know, this, is, this is a good way to, to end the class, just showing that for tens of thousands of years or longer, humans have been interacting with, with biology. Um, not quite the same way that you might have interacted with biology this year, um, but the point is, should still be taken, the connection between humans and understanding the biological world around them. All right, so time to wrap it up, right? So I hope this and all the other lecture videos have been helpful. Um, I appreciate you, you know, joining me for the ride, the combined sprint marathon that is AP Biology. And it's time to wrap this one up. All right, see you guys later.